Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Brickwork Podcast. Um, I know we've been uh, on a bit of a hiatus, but we just completed our community seed round. Uh, and so, um, yay, you know, that's that's already done now. So we want to kind of restart these uh, kind of uh, uh, wanting to bring insight to you guys and, and people in the market that do. And so, but before I do, I wanted to first introduce Milan Mills. She's our new head of growth. Hi, Milan. Hi. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, look, um, I'm really wanting her to take over uh, the podcast. And so she's here for the first episode, but um, you're going to be seeing much more of her and less of me. And I think that's a good thing. So anyways, uh, go ahead, Milan. Why don't you kick it off for us? Awesome. Yeah. So today our guest is Will Tao, the founder of Tao Properties. Will is the Director of Commercial Real Estate Division at Collective Realty and the owner of Tao Properties, a property management and real estate investment company. Um, Tao Properties currently manages nearly 200 units throughout greater Los Angeles. So to kind of just kick things off, Will, tell us about you know, yourself as well as how Tao Properties came about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you, John and Milan, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, been, been a big fan of Brickwork for a while, so and, and a user as well. So, so thanks for having me. Um, so, a little bit about my background. Um, so, uh, gosh, where do I begin? So, my my family's uh, well, my my parents are originally from Taiwan, and my dad was a college professor at Kansas State University in Manhattan, Kansas. And uh, so also known as the Little Apple. And um, my dad, you know, while he was still a professor, he started to um, kind of uh, get interested in apartments. He started to kind of uh, invest in and then start managing small apartment buildings near campus, thinking student housing. And um, he eventually got so involved in that, he ended up having hundreds and hundreds of units that um, he uh, at first was managing for other people and then eventually started, you know, buying and investing in more. And uh, and so I kind of grew up in the business mm. uh, of, of kind of real estate investing and management in particular. Um, I had a totally different career. I, um, I have a bachelor's and master's in international relations. Uh, I was actually trained to be more of a diplomat. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I worked in, uh, I worked on and off in DC, Washington, DC for about 10 years. I worked both in the Clinton administration and the uh, George W. Bush administration. Um, and uh, my last position was as an international economist. And I was on the team that used to negotiate international trade agreements. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I realized that I wasn't a very good bureaucrat. <laughs> <laughs> I tried my best, but I'm yeah. not. I'm not a good kind of like a cubicle person. <laughs> so, um, so um, I had started experimenting just on the side as a hobby. I had started acting on the side just for fun, oh. and um, and I kind of like it. Just kind of took off without me even really trying. Like. First it was a play, then it was a national commercial, then it was a TV show, then it was a movie. And wow. I just like, I started going up to New York and uh, got an agent up there. And then I eventually, eventually brought me out here. And, um, and it was just the time in my life where it felt like a good time for a career switch. So I did. Um, but so when I moved out here, that was 20 years ago now, mm. uh, like it was this, this like 20 years ago, exactly. And the first thing I did when I got out of here was kind of my real estate like side kind of kicked in. <laughs> so I, I co-owned a building uh, with my family in Kansas. Wow. And um, my family, you know, my dad calls me up. He's like, hey, we got an offer on, on our building. Are you interested in doing a 1031 exchange? And at that point, I had never done a 1031 exchange. I didn't know what it was. Mm. Um, and so... Um, so I, I was, I was like, yeah, sure. What is it? How do we do it? <laughs> and so I, I walked through that whole process and, um, I remember I was like the worst client. I had two real estate agents. <laughs> I had one from, uh, Echo Park to West Hollywood, another from Beverly Hills to Santa Monica. Oh. And I canvassed the city like back and forth. I looked at over 200 buildings. Wow. wow. And, um, I ended up <laughs> ironically, 
buying the very first building I saw, <laughs> which was <laughs> a fourplex in Los Feliz. And goodbye. Um, yeah, it ended up being a goodbye for us, you know. Um, it was also a good time, you mm-hmm. know, at that time, like 0203, like oh, the market was starting yeah. to blow up. Back up. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I always like to use this example. So, okay, so in Kansas, I started with 12 units. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was it was mm-hmm. a new bill of 12 mm-hmm. units. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I exchanged those 12 units and I bought four units here mm-hmm. in California. Mm-hmm. Two years later, I got an off- we got an offer we couldn't refuse. So we ended up selling that fourplex and then going back to Kansas. So oh, wow. okay. apples, apples to apples, 12 <laughs> units in Kansas, four units in California. Four units in California, two years later, guess how many I bought in Kansas? 12? Oh, More like double keep that? Going. <laughs> keep going. Keep going. 24? Keep going. Keep going. Oh, oh my goodness. A hundred? <laughs> we bought 54 units. Oh my God. Oh my from God. From the original. So, wow. so obviously if I just kept my 12 units, right? Like I'd yeah. still be at 12. Yeah. But by bringing it to California right. and then using that kind of, you know, raw, you know, the, the type of appreciation we get here is just, you know, not, it's okay. not like anywhere else in the country. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back to Kansas and I four and a half times what I had. Previously. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, so that, that taught me a big lesson, mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. About what this market can do, yeah. you know, if you're able to kind of go back and forth uh, from both in state and out of state, and depending on what you're looking for, whether you're looking for cash flow or you're looking for appreciation, you know, those are oftentimes the trade-offs. So, um, and, and I worked, you know, during that entire time, I was, I was working in the film business and I, I, I worked on that side. Mm-hmm. And then, um, after, after the, the way crash and everything, um, in 2011, uh, 2012, uh, my then, uh, my then fiance now, now wife and partner, mm-hmm. uh, we decided to get our real estate licenses. And, um, because I already had this kind of background in investing and stuff. Mm-hmm. And I ended up, you know, we ended up getting our licenses. Uh, we, we had bought a house on the east side of Los Angeles and, you know, um, and just started immediately got into multifamily just because of my background. And we started buying primarily for investors, a lot of whom were not in Los Angeles and who needed someone to manage their properties. So uh, we, we fell into that niche very quickly. And, um, and so now that's, that's our, what we're known for. So we have three parts to our company. Mm. I'm, I'm the main broker. I mostly do um, uh, sales. Uh, so listing and, and purchases of multifamily and mixed use properties. Um, we have a management side that my wife runs and we have over 200 units now that we manage. Mm. And then um, we're also investors and developers ourselves. Um, so, um, so it's, it's three parts of the business, obviously each side kind of, you know, takes care of the other. Yeah, that's, um, fascinating and, um, unique too. I didn't say a lot of people out there, um, you know, obviously they're kind of focused on one piece or aspect of that. Yes. Business. The fact that you have all three is uh, fascinating. I think it gives weight to kind of advice that you or uh, consult, right? So if someone comes to you and brand new and they have those atypical questions, should I buy a multifamily? How do I even manage it? You could just kind of open up the blueprint of what you're currently doing. We, we are like one of the few all-in-one yeah. um, companies. Like you said, most people either focus on brokerage or mm-hmm. focus on management or focus mm-hmm. on development. Like those right. are right. three very distinct, you know, areas of real mm-hmm. estate. Um, but, you know, just because of it's, it's it, and it was truly just organic for us. It just mm-hmm. kind of evolved this way. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. We primarily work with, frankly, you know, kind of mom and pop investors, you mm-hmm. know, a lot of people who own anywhere from one unit to, you know, could be 70 or plus units, whatever it is, but through several buildings. And uh, we tend to get a lot of those types of clients mm-hmm. and people who are looking to kind of build and then eventually obviously retire, hopefully on, on, on their, on their portfolio. Okay. So I kind of want to go into this question with you. Um, you know, uh, just to preface, uh, we first met at the, uh, area event, 
uh, in downtown. And uh, I was so excited when I got that invite because obviously with COVID, that was my first in person. So in think, person, right? Yeah. <laughs> so a lot of people, I think you guys had, uh, like, Area had an event one prior to that one, but I didn't know about that one. So this one in downtown by multifamily, I was like, ah, oh, I got, I have to go. But for those of you who don't know, ARIA stands for Asian American Real Estate Association. Yes. So ARIA, yes. And, and they have local chapters everywhere. Uh, that's the LA All chapter. Across the country. Yep, yep, yep. And that event particularly, um, it was fascinating. Uh, I, I absolutely, I, you're a natural great speaker and you drew me in when you were talking about tenants in common or ticks and kind of weighing those advantages and stuff. But I think I want to kind of start off with that question because I think a lot of people in our audience, whether they're commercial brokers or developers might not know about kind of the advantage of, of that kind of ownership. So I guess that's the first sure. question. Kind of, can you give us what ticks are? Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, TICs, T-I-C's, stand for Tenants in Common. Mm -hmm. And um, really all it means is like where you have more than one person on title. Mm -hmm. So, um, and a lot of, you know, in, in previous times, like, you know, a lot of people have probably heard of TICs mostly in the field of like, say, uh, 1031 exchanges where maybe people are buying into like, say a shopping mall or a large mm -hmm. hotel, and mm -hmm. there's like a hundred investors in there and yeah. they're exchanging into, maybe they're taking their $2 million piece and placing it in the hotel, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever it is, you know, and there's a, however many owners of that property there are. So that's one type of tenant in common where, you know, um, another type is a timeshare. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a timeshare. Uh, you know, through the, through Hilton and I own one fifty second. you know, I own one week out of, out of 52 in a year, you know, to, to stay at my property. You Hawaii, know? So, Maui, Cancun, <laughs> those are the atypical. So my partner, Alex, just came back from a timeshare in Maui and it was the Hilton one, by the way. So, yeah. There we go. So, yeah. So, so usually those are, those are considered tenant in common, you know, properties. Mm. Um, but the type of tenant in common property that I, I, I was speaking about, and I believe yet you're speaking about, and that kind of fits into this multifamily space, mm. is what's known as a space allocation TIC. Mm. So um, let's say the three of us decided to buy uh, a triplex together. Yes. Right? Like the, there's a three unit property, um, and John, John owns a third, Milano owns a third, I own a third. We're all one third, one third owners. And let's just say, for sake of ease, that all the units are the same, right? Mm -hmm. They're all two bedrooms. That's awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, you know, obviously not all properties are like this. One could be bigger. I could own the three bedroom. Uh, John could own the one bedroom. Milan could own a five bedroom. Like, <laughs> you know, it just depends <laughs> on the property itself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, and technically in a tenant in common, we would all own the property together. Technically, mm. we could all go into each other's spaces because we all own a piece of the whole pie, right? Mm. However, um, so the type of TICs that we're starting to deal with, that we're starting to convert from multifamily are known as space allocation TICs, where let's say John's in unit one, I'm in unit two, Milan's in unit three. We would each agree that we only have the right to go into our own particular unit, mm. right? So only nice. John can go to his, only I can go to mine, Milan can go to hers, okay? Mm. And let's say, once again, let's make these numbers easy. Like, let's say we bought the triplex for 750000 We each put in 250000 right. to buy it, right? Right, right. So um, let's say one day Milan's like, you know, I'm tired of this. I want to, you know, I want to buy my own house, mm. right? Mm. And she wants to share, sell her share of the TIC. Mm. She can do that, right? Mm. Now, the issue is this, right? We bought it together mm -hmm. as a $750,000, you know, triplex. Right. So our property tax basis is now at $750,000, right? Mm. But let's say Milan does well. Let's say she sells her portion for $500,000. She doubles her money. Okay. Oh, yeah. Now the basis of the building is now a million dollars. It's mm. no longer 750,000. Now our property tax basis all goes up. I right? see. Does that mean me and John have to pay more property tax? All depends on how you structure this. But the way we typically have things structured, whoever buys Milan's unit 
has to pay for that difference. Smart. We still would all have certain shared expenses, right? Because there might be one water main, right? Depends on how the electricity is run. There might be, you know, like we, we would have to figure out any shared expenses, like any HOA would, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you're in a condo, you would have the same thing. But the big difference between a condo and a TIC is that you don't own your unit. You own right. a percentage of the building. Got it. So that's that's the, that's basically in a nutshell what it is. I love that explanation. That just gets right. Like you automatically kind of understand what this is. Now, what are the advantages of that versus how certain people are buying it just based on an LLC? Automatically, it just tells me there's an ease of kind of shared ownership. There's could be partnerships that are had and, and everyone could kind of create a portfolio of multifamily in this structure with multiple people? Is there a kind of an ease of getting in and out versus maybe an LLC or? Uh, yeah, so, so TICs really started, TICs really started up in the Bay Area where they were having issues, right? You, you had a large population base that wanted to buy, but maybe couldn't afford to, you know, and, and there was also a lack of inventory, right? There's just not yes. a lot yes. of, of supply. I see. So uh, people started to say, hey, we live in a triplex, let's just, Let's just eat, let's buy it. You know, let's each the three, you know, all of us get together and we buy it and we we parcel it out and we mm. we figure out who owes what and all those things. So that's kind of how it started. I see. And and definitely it's something that, you know, um, in terms of buying it in an LLC, you know, obviously how you want to structure however you want to buy something, that's that's up to you. Mm. An LLC would not technically be a tenant in common. Right. That would be a partnership, right? Right. right, right. And, and I get I get a lot of people ask me, well, what's the difference between say a TIC and a co-op? Which mm -hmm. uh, co-ops are something most people have heard of, particularly in New York. New York, right? Yeah, yeah. New York's very well known for co-ops, but there's a big difference between a mm. TIC and a co-op. Mm. A, a, a co-op is a co corporation. You're buying shares yes. in a company that right. owns the entire building, right. and with any shareholder people can say no to certain shareholders. Uh, voting right. Okay? Yes. So, so like the most famous example is Madonna wanting to buy it into a co-op in New York and the, and the co-op saying no. <laughs> like they didn't want Madonna in their, yeah. in their co-op. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in a TIC, if once again, depending on how you structure it, generally the ones, the way we do it is like, say, going back to our example, say Milan decided like, I want to, I want to sell my portion. It, if it's structured correctly, John and I would have no say in mm -hmm. who Milan could, could sell it to. She could sell it to whoever she wants, I see. whoever wants to pay that $500,000 difference, you know? Yeah. And now we would have a new neighbor and a new end person in the TIC with us, I you see. know? I see. So, so yeah. that's, that's a big difference. Now, a lot of people ask, well, why not just like turn into a condo? Like why, mm -hmm. why, why do a TIC? Well, I mean, you may even know this more than I do, John, but like, I mean, my understanding is to convert something to a condo is, is much more difficult. First of all, you own your condo, which means that that wherever it's zoned, it has to be mapped yeah. as a condo map. There has to be APNs for each of the units, yep. okay? Mm -hmm. That have parking requirements, mm -hmm. electrical requirement, permitting requirements, there's public you know, there's public, uh, you know, uh, discussion. Uh, yes. it, it could require a lot of changes to yes. the building and a lot of fees in order to get. And even after that, you may not get it approved. Right. You know, because there could be neighbors who could stop it. Right. So that's one of the main reasons why a lot of people aren't able to convert their property into a condo, even if they wanted to. Right. A TIC, however, is a private agreement between the owners and the courts have ruled on this that mm -hmm. the courts do not want to be involved in TICs because they're like no it's an agreement the three of us have agreed mm -hmm. we're going to own this together yeah and however you guys want to structure it within yourselves you know is, is the way it is now that obviously has certain positive and negatives right mm -hmm. because obviously if you own your own unit you have one prop. You are responsible for your, for your property tax. Right. You are also responsible for you know whatever financing and all that stuff. Um, whereas if the three of us own it together, we there's one property tax bill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if one of us decides, eh, I'm not going to pay it, 
you know, then that becomes an issue. Yes. Between the three yes. of us, you know, so so these are the kinds of like trade offs you have to consider. Now, the other big trade off, which has been a big issue, is the financing for the buyers. Yes. So most banks won't don't like to lend on TICs because you don't own your unit. You own right. a piece of the property. How can they foreclose on a piece of the property, right? You know, that's that's been an issue, but yeah. more, it's called fractional lending. Mm. But more and more lenders are, are getting into the space. When, you know, I first started selling TICs, there was only two banks that you could go to that would do TIC lending. Now there's like four or five banks. Easily. Previously, yeah, um, previously they didn't even have a 30 year fixed product. Yeah. Now they have 30 year fixed products, although they're still not that common. They're still mostly um, adjustable rate mortgages, ARM right. products. Right. They tend to be more expensive, these products. You know, usually it's about a half point to two points higher mm -hmm. than, say, if you bought a condo or a single family. Right. So for that reason, ticks are usually priced about 10 to 15% below I what see. you would see as in a condo. Mm. So it's a great, so a lot of people are like, wow. That, that that property is so like why is it priced that way it seems like it's really you know very affordable and very expensive but then you get into it and you're like oh you, you're you're buying into a tick you're not buying into a, a condo you know so there's just these trade-offs that you know buyers and sellers have to think about now going back to your question john about why own it as a as a tick versus an llc mm -hmm. so um i mean this is more of a legal question and i'm not 100 percent sure but i do know like i said it might be easier, for example, if we owned it as a TIC to be able to sell each of our individual portions oh, yes. versus getting out of an so. LLC, mm -hmm. right? Because you have to then redo the LLC, redo the operating agreement. You know, you have to do all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, so, so setting it up as a tick might allow a, like greater flexibility for, for the people involved. You know, so. Oh, absolutely. I see that. And then just touching on kind of the fractional lending, because I'm a, uh, my background is in loans and I've been a broker for 14 years. There is a definite move toward equity investment versus, uh, so, so the concept is, okay, we understand fractional ownership and we're willing to lend under those kind of uh, structures, but there's this move in uh, fintech that we I've been personally working with, like there's a company called Point uh, out of San Francisco that now allows homeowners, they'll invest in the equity. And the funny part is their investors are all the LPs that invest in the venture funds. So it's just another percentage of their overall pie that they go, oh, this percent will go to venture. This percent will go to this institution. They just created another size of pie that says, well, you know what? Why don't we just directly invest in single family ownership. So they'll give you 350 or 500,000 for say 18%. So they're sharing the upside. So you don't have to even pay for, uh, it's not a loan. You don't pay payments. There's no repayment period for up to 10 years, but there's a high upside because they know the trends and they know, Hey, if you use that money, you build an ADU or you split the lot and build a duplex, we're already making money. So it's kind of shared appreciation. So I'm curious to see, um, and I, I might have to reach out on them, uh, their willingness to even be a, a, a potential lender on ticks, but definitely yeah. see the uh, advantages of the ease of going in and out. Now, the I, I kind of really, really interested in this next question and getting your um, thoughts on this is so um, in your uh, community, that's um, like you said, mom and pops that are wanting to get in and, and, and invest in multifamily, they're already invested and they're looking to scale and they're also operators uh, as well. Kind of what is the interest that you're seeing from them in development? Meaning like you talked about, there's so few and few inventory and that's going to be a problem, right? There's so few uh, multifamily uh, properties that are priced right, I would say, right? Maybe a lot of them are, yeah. are compressed cap rates. So kind of, you know, do you see an interest starting to kind of gain traction? And then if you do, what are kind of the challenges that you see that they are kind of hesitant in wanting to build uh, multifamily for themselves? Well, I'm absolutely seeing a huge spike in interest mm -hmm. in uh, people who are interested in building ADUs or figuring out how to, you know, um, develop their properties or finding a property that they can then add to. I'll, I'll give a straight example. I, uh, two years ago, um, 
I helped a client buy a fourplex um, in the Valley, uh, Lake Balboa area near Van Nuys. And, um, you know, he got it for a great price. He got it for under a million dollars. And then what he did was he then took the garage, the non-living space and converted those into two ADUs. Awesome. Regular size ADU, two bedroom, and then a junior ADU. Yeah. Um, And now we're turning around and we're selling it as six units. However, Mm. interested speaking about the lending side, I've spoken to a number of lenders that have said, well, actually it's still zoned as a fourplex. Yeah. So I would give you residential financing for this six unit, which is like, that that's very interesting for a lot of folks, right? Because now you can get a thirty year loan on this. Right, if that's what you want. You right, know? versus so, a five year um, fixed arm product. versus a five year or whatever it is. You know, obviously with rate shifting, you know, it's it, you just have to see if, what what makes sense. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely seeing that. I'm definitely getting buyers who are like, I want something that I can build on. I want something that you know, because they see the trends. You know, yes. they're like, absolutely, they're looking to how to, you know, how to, how to build more basically, you know, Absolutely. so, um, th- there's, there's no doubt that now in terms of their concerns, well, obviously there's one thing between being interested in the other, having the capacity to carry it out. Right. I mean, <laughs> exactly. as we know, it, there's a whole, there's, there's a big difference between, you know, like thinking about actually, and then actually like hiring an architect and getting the engineers and, you know, getting all the plans and going through plan check and, you know, doing the actual work, that's a whole different level. And, and how long it be, takes, right? How long it takes. And, you know, these are things that, you know, obviously a lot of, a lot of the, the mom and pops aren't quite prepared for, but you're seeing, you know, people are starting to get more sophisticated. Mm. Um, and I always say, you know, I probably should, I, I always wonder if I should say this out loud, but I do anyways. It's like, there is, there are these kind of break points in the market. I always say that like up to about two and a half million, mm. you're still kind of in the mom and pop world. But then once you get past two and a half, three million until about 15 million, you know, institutional people don't go below 15 or 20 million, right? Because it's too small. Right, so there's this world I call it the meso world <laughs> between about three million and fifteen million. Yeah, so there's some really interesting, you know, opportunities and deals, you know, and and we play a lot in that space, you know. So it's like it's mom and pops who have gotten beyond, you know, the mom and pop stage, and they there's you know maybe they've owned it for a while or or they just have a certain amount of equity, mm-hmm. and now they start playing in an area where. They're below, they're, they're above what most mom and pops can afford. Yeah. You know, but still, I mean, like I said, below the Black Rocks. <laughs> you know, so Absolutely. there's there's a very interesting space in that kind of, like I, I call it the mezzo world. Yeah. And I just, a uh, quick plug is uh, for anyone watching that uh, are uh, interested in getting in development, we have prided ourselves for the past three years to be at least uh, uh, your first step into kind of understanding what you can and can't build. And it's um, no risk because you're just getting the information from us. You're not committing to purchasing, opening escrow or doing anything else. So definitely, I think uh, 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 we would at least let you know what you can and can't do as far as zoning for those properties. But Will, getting back to, you mentioned ADU. So now this is an interesting space, right? I think the state desperately needs housing. They're just trying to do whatever they can and they're getting beyond even overriding the cities at this point. And there's lawsuits flying abound and it's all politics and it's atypical, but it is, it's almost necessary at this point, right? To, to provide uh, immediate housing. And obviously ADUs and accessory dwelling units have finally uh, iterated or evolved from you know 2017 where it's like oh you could build a tiny one and you could convert but cities can say yay or nay and they all almost to a t said no <laughs> right they limited it then every year it got a little bit better it got a little bit better and i think 2020 blew open doors and they were just like nope you could do two and one and a junior no parking and you know they're going to give you buy right and p- quick plan check and all of this good stuff so with that being said I guess um, the opportunity for multifamily uh, owners and investors would be to look at non-living space, right? And seeing, Mm -hmm. like you had said, that example. Well, up until two years ago, you couldn't build an ADU on multifamily, right? I mean, it was was all single family, family, right? It was all single family. So 
this this AU in multifamily is, is very new. Yeah. And obviously, if you're already in the multifamily space, you're probably a little bit more sophisticated than just owning a single family, right? Okay. So, okay. If, so a lot of the people who are already in that space are looking to figure out ways to add value. You know, uh, I, I work mostly with investors who want to add value to their properties or mm. figure out mm. ways to add value. So like, absolutely, I, you know, I closed the deal um, just a couple, uh, last month, mm. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it was one of the first um, multifamily ADUs that was approved in the mm. city, you mm. know? So, um, and um, and so he went from five to six units, you That's know? Great. So like every, Every unit that comes on is, you know, more housing, like you said. And so they're, they are absolutely, the, the state and the city are trying to push, you know, uh, developers to add more housing. And people are, and I, a lot of the listings now that I see that are coming through are like, hey, possibility for ADUs or RTI for ADUs exactly. or like stuff like that. Like that's definitely a big selling point and, and something that a lot of buyers are looking for. Awesome. And uh, one thing I was going to mention is uh, I think you know, uh, all of the design kind of periods and builds for multifamily, if you look back, even in the early 1900s, not all multifamily are built in the 1900s, but typically during that era, uh, the the living spaces were small, but the communal spaces were large. So there's actually a lot of like storage and rec rooms and laundry rooms and stuff like that, because they were just like, oh, you know, I I just need a bed and a sofa and a small kitchen, right? No need for like, 2,000 square feet, and then they really wanted uh, 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 residents in that apartment to get to know each other. You know, it was a different time, obviously, than now, right? So that seems like the perfect kind of, you know, designed, if they haven't done anything since that original build, if you could find those properties, they'd be primed to be able to convert uh, to ADUs. Absolutely. And, and, And speaking of, like, I, I definitely see more and more developments looking, moving into the kind of the co-living space, Yeah, you know, um, and that's, you know, and that's very much that style that you're talking about, like small yep. living, like, you know, bedrooms, yeah. but large communal areas, you know, right. where people can and congregate and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm definitely seeing more and more of those on the market. Now, so we're right now, May 3rd, and the Fed has just met, and I haven't checked, uh, the the uh, news as of yet, but I, I already know what's coming. So uh, you know, we all do, right? <laughs> <laughs> rates are going up, and they're already jumped up to a point where conventional rates are in the fives right now. And I'm working on you know even like you know DSCR loans, uh, non QM, right? Debt service coverage ratio for investment rental properties and multifamily and stuff like that. And those are already in the sixes. So they're always gonna be about a hundred basis points above what the, the conventional rate is, right? And so, yeah. it, you know, okay. So all of that being said, we know what's coming. It's gonna be here this year into next year. Hopefully they could re- uh, unwind and it goes back down latter part of next year, but let's see. But what's, what is its effect with multifamily that you're seeing? So, uh, uh, you know, compared to single family investments, is multifamily a little bit more cushion because rising rates would just compress cap rates even more than what they are? And then does that drive uh, purchases outside of California or, you know what I'm saying, in other markets? Uh, trying to find yield. What's kind of your, uh, you know, take on, on, on all of that? Um, well, that, there's a lot there. <laughs> so um, I would say this, that, you know, one thing about this is that it, um, about interest rates is, is it's a very, it's, it's, a, it's a large bludgeoning tool, right? So interest rates are not just going to go up in California. They're going to go up everywhere, everywhere. right? Yeah. Wherever you go in, in the country, right? So everywhere you're going to start seeing the cap rates start to fluctuate and yeah. yield starts, you know, all those things. So it wouldn't matter where yeah. you are, you know, yeah. um, I think always the issue more in California has, and, and you, I've, I've seen you talk about this on this podcast is more legislation that worries a lot of folks, you know, right. uh, and what that means for a lot of kind of multifamily operators and whatnot, mm-hmm. but definitely, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt that interest rates are going to have an effect on the, and, and are having an effect on the market. You know, there's, there's no doubt about that. And um, that said, I think it's not quite as, how shall I say, immediately serious as it is like in the, in the single family world. Like, I feel like 
single family, it's just kind of like all my mortgage friends are telling me like the lever just shut off like six yeah. weeks ago. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> once once yeah. rates started going into the fives, like people just started like, you know, shutting things off for the waiting time, till a couple know? years later to buy. Yeah. 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 Whereas on the multifamily side, like as long as, you know, once again, it's all about numbers, right? As long as the numbers work and, you know, you're still getting certain rates of return and you're still seeing, you know, certain increases. And we're definitely still seeing strong increases on, on the rent side. Once again, depending on, you know, the, uh, the legislative world that you live in, where, where, you, where you own. But generally speaking, as we know, there's, there's a housing crisis and, and that includes on the rental side and particularly on the rental side. Yeah. And so, um, you know, our, our occupancy rates, like we're our vacancy rate, we just had a team meeting this morning is like under 1%. Wow. Okay. Wow. So okay. like, yeah. just because like, you know, there's, you know, you have housing as long as, <laughs> as long as it's reasonably priced and it's, you know, like, yeah, people need housing, you know? And so I think that if you talk to most operators right now, they're under 5%, they're probably at like three or 4%. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, I think, you know, those are hard rates to beat. You know, there's not a lot of other asset classes where you can have that short of a vacancy. And oftentimes those vacancies, are, it's just about turnaround time. It's like, okay, we might be vacant now, but we won't be vacant, you know, in a few weeks. Absolutely. You know, so, so that's, I mean, the, the long-term fundamentals of that are not changing anytime soon because we're not building housing fast enough. Agreed. Right? And mm -hmm. it's going to take a while, as we know, to get to that point. So, um, so I'm still seeing, I'm definitely still seeing, um, you know, trading. It's definitely people are being more careful about the numbers they're crunching and whether or not it makes sense. Um, people have been going out. Of We've had a number of folks, you know, definitely sell and then look at buying something out of state. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, you know, a lot of people still want to stay in state. They want, still want something that they can see and they can touch and, you know, that they feel more comfortable with. They, they may not feel as comfortable buying a 7-Eleven in South Carolina if they've never been to South Carolina, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, or Even though the cap rate is 6% or 8% or whatever the they're whatever, Yeah. is, whatever, you know? I mean, I'm, I still have property in Kansas, you know? And, um, you know you know, on a, on a price per unit can probably get, get like a hundred, like a unit for like a hundred K or less, you know, wow. which is almost wow. unheard of here. Right. Yeah. Um, but then you have to know that market and just because you buy something cheap doesn't necessarily mean it's going to get you a return. Like I've had yeah. people buy in Ohio and then lose their shirts because yeah. even though the houses were 50,000, they still had property taxes. They still had insurance. They still had all their expenses and they couldn't rent them out. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so yeah. everything it's totally dependent on, on what you're looking for. So, you know, but I, definitely, I, I think there's no doubt that, that the market is shifting and, and people are going to start looking at their numbers more carefully. Yeah, that's interesting. I think um, for us too, even though we've been around three years and we're obviously advocates for new multifamily development, I think we're agnostic in the fact that, you know, there's a space and there's a place for like the Cumulus project, right? Near Culver City and they're building a thousand units and it's mixed use or Ivy Station or, you know, th those, that's the product that's getting built. But I really like the diversity of what you guys own and also help your clients purchase is in these historic neighborhoods as well, a four unit, a eight unit, a six unit, it still affords the kind of like lifestyle where, you know, you work at Google or TikTok and you end the day and certain people, yeah, they love in, to be in an amenity rich luxury apartment, right? Again, there's a place for that. And there's people that are going to be tenants for that. There's also a big side of uh, tenants that want kind of that single family neighborhood, like, a lifestyle, you know, like walk your dog, go jogging. And so I think LA, I really, what I really, I'm not saying that I'm biased and I love LA, but like the diversity of these neighborhoods are really cool, right? That you can yeah. quickly be really like in downtown or in center city. And that completely looks different than if you go into these neighborhoods and nooks and crannies, right? So, um, yeah, absolutely. No, I couldn't agree more. And we ourselves are starting to get into development ourselves like as as investors um you know we've got um we've got a property we've got a couple properties that we're developing um 
one in Highland Park that's currently a triplex. Yeah, love Highland. Uh, but but it's um, on a 15,000 square foot lot in RD3. Wow. So we technically can build up to 14, so we're, we're proposing 10. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, so, and it's in a historic zone. So we're, we're kind of getting into that process now. Yeah. And then we're working on another project, which is, you know, so it's currently a, uh, a nine unit mixed use, six commercial and three residential. Oh, wow. And we're, and we're proposing it's, it's on a double commercial lot. Mm. So, um, we are proposing a 50 unit. Great. Uh, mixed yeah. Use. Yeah. And uh, so, this is in Boyle Heights. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, what's interesting is like, so our experience with the commercial units, obviously during COVID and everything and, and, and during the pandemic is that, you know, it can be hard to rent out those kind of even small commercial spaces, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so our proposal is actually to leave the commercial space open mm. and turn that into kind of a mini grand central market oh, and do wow. like stalls, yes. you know, and so Smart. we can, and it can be more affordable even for vendors, you know, and pop-ups and whatnot. And then we Ghost can turn it into a kind I mean, of, those are exploding right now. Exactly. So, Smart. so, so Smart. now there's like an opportunity for people to kind of use it as you'd like to talk about a communal space. Yeah. And, um, and so we're, we're, we're in that, we're, we're in it now, you know, and we're, we're going through plan check and everything. So, um, you know, so yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting. I think there's, there are tremendous opportunities and at the same time, you know, tremendous opportunities to see, and, and we're, we're, we're very involved in the communities. Like I'm, I'm on the Silver Lake Chamber, I'm on the Boyle Heights Chamber, I, you know, working with a lot of nonprofits in those areas. Yeah, and I like Boyle Heights. We're, yeah, we, we, we are very, we try to be involved in those communities because, because I think there is, you know, unfortunately or unfortunately, there is this sense of like, you know, there's this narrative about like developers always being gentrifiers, always being, you know, like pressing yeah. people out of their own yeah. neighborhoods. And, you know, we manage like hundreds of units in these areas. And we're we're pretty attuned to our tenant base. I mean, we have to be right. We're, yes. we're always in we're always in the market. Yes. So a lot of what we are looking to do is very much because of what our tenants have asked us or yeah. said that they would like to see yeah. in those neighborhoods. Yeah. And so, um, and, and it's obviously a constant you know discussion and whatnot. But you know, we're trying to like get involved and encourage the type of development that you know, that includes neighborhoods, includes communities so that they can feel like a part of, and it should be, you know, it's, it's in their neighborhoods, but in a way to, you know, um, that, that makes sense for everybody, right? Obviously it has to pencil out financially. These things have to make sense, you know, for the ownership group and whatnot. But mm -hmm. beyond that, like, you know, there are certain things that communities want, you yes. know, and as long as you're, you know, able to help provide those types of amenities for them, like, you know, there can be tremendous support that we found. So that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad that you uh, brought that up too. And I'm, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can't wait to see that topping out and I wish you luck on that project, the 50 unit. Um, it, the, the other point too, is I think, uh, what people don't realize is there are certain developers that won't go to those neighborhoods to ge even gentrify, right? They're passing them up. They're not, they're saying, oh, walking score and this and that, but underlying, you know, the reason why they're passing. And some of them, unfortunately, are just highlighting, oh, we just want Santa Monica, Santa Monica only. And I'm like, <laughs> not everyone could build in Santa Monica, right? Like, I get why they're yeah. saying that, but it's just, sure. it's a cop out, you know? Like, it's much better to, uh, to get deep. And someone like you, I think you're uh, much more in tune and uh, uh, in a better position to be building in that neighborhood with those tenant base. So it was really... Uh, Nice, good catching up with you, Will. I'm going to let Milan kind of uh, end this here and, and wrap up for us. So take it away. Yeah, no, thank you so much for being on the show, Will. I definitely learned a lot from you. And I think you're just like a natural born storyteller. So it was definitely yeah, a pleasure you. to have you on. Um, yeah, was there any final insights you wanted to share? Or any remarks? You know, I think, you know, as kind of the theme, if I had to like kind of encapsulate a theme of, of this is that, you know, there are really so many opportunities, you know, in Los Angeles in a way that I think, I think there's a, obviously the theme, like people are priced out of LA, like people, you know, like people are leaving, people are whatnot. But 
LA is so diverse. <laughs> like there's so many opportunities for different people in different spaces. And, um, and so we try to fill in those gaps where, you know, and, and, and encourage people to get involved. You know, I, I think that what you guys are doing is great because you guys are identifying potential opportunities for people to, to grow, you know, in a, in a, in my opinion, in a very organic way, just by learning more, getting the information, what else could you build here? What else could you do? Cause we desperately need it. Like, this is something that like, you know, it's, it's political it's social. It's in my opinion, it's moral. Like we, you know, the situation that we're in right now with, with, you know, housing and, you know, and homelessness and all these issues that, that we're all talking about, you know, we're here, we're in this community, we need to be building, we need to be, you know, providing amenities and whatnot. And this is a, there's opportunities for everybody, in my opinion, to be involved in this. And so uh, we're excited to work with you guys. And thank you for the opportunity to speak on this, on this podcast and, you know, look forward to working with you more. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Will. I'm going to put all of your information in the show notes. Anybody uh, that wants to get break into multifamily, Will is your guy. I, I, I can't vouch for him uh, more. Uh, even if you're not a mom and pop, anybody just interested, just reach out to Will and his firm on all three fronts. Thank you, Will, so much. Thank you. For thank, you. thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mima. Take care. Bye.